Okay. Um, hi, welcome to uh, my presentation. Uh, my name is Santa Barraza. I'm actually born and raised in Kingsville, and I went back to Kingsville. And um, but I was educated at UT Austin. I was there in the 1970s, and then I left and went and taught elsewhere. I taught in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was an art professor. And then I taught in uh, the School of the Art Institute. Well, I taught at Penn State University. My neighbor was Joe Paterno. And then I went to uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and I taught there. And then I actually came to San Antonio and I did public art at UTSA. So I don't know if you've seen it, you should go and see it. I did, you're gonna see some of it in the, in the presentation. <clears throat> but I did um, two murals. One is a retablo mural. It's on a curved wall on the Biosciences Building. And I worked with Alice Adams from New York City. She did the water fountain. There's like a rotunda mural, and I did the mural above it. So, uh, and it all deals with indigenous art and Hispanic art and Chicano art, and it's really, we even got an award. We went to the Smithsonian in New York City, and we presented the project, and it's in the archives at the Smithsonian. So anyway, it was a really interesting project. So you'll see a little bit about it. So I had planned all these things, but I think I'm just gonna talk and make it very informal. So um, this is actually a map. Um, my presentation is a visual iconography of uh, decolonization and reclamation of indigenismo at the borderlands. So um, I was very much influenced by the land and the people and the culture. And so I always, and um, when I say the culture, I mean also curanderismo. You know, when I went to graduate school, we, um, I was told by my professors, I was doing murals. I was doing fiberglass murals. I was gonna do a mural at the, I think it was called the Terrazas Library. Uh, we had a drawing and everything ready to do. And the professors told me uh, that I had to abandon my project. I was doing fiberglass murals. And they said, you can't do murals because it's not really art. You have to do individual art. So I had to abandon it. So then I started doing what they told me to do. They told me, well, you can, you can, if you want to, you can fight us. You know, I had a committee of professors and they said, well, you can fight us if you want to, but you're not gonna win and you won't get your degree. So the best thing is for you to, to make a decision if you want to fight us or you wanna graduate. So I decided, you know, I need that paper and I need to graduate. So I changed everything, so I never did the mural. But maybe later on we can do it. Yeah. But anyway, um, so at that point I decided, I felt like I'm not valid. I'm not really a valid person because I don't exist in the books. There was nothing about us at that time. Um, this was, I went there in the 1970s. I did my graduate work in 1979. So I thought, you know, we're not even valid, so I need to validate myself. So that's when I started doing research about who we were, like self-identifying myself instead of identifying myself through the dominant culture and Western ideology. So I, by doing that, I had to do research. And of course, there were no books on us, nothing. So I started by looking at the culture and looking at my family and all the cuentos and stories in the family. And that's how I started to do my art. Um, oh, that map, I wanna tell you that map is really important because this map was done in 1792. And actually it's a map that maps South Texas. It's called, uh, it's the Nuevo Santander map in 1792. And it uh, delineates the area from uh, Querétaro, all the way up to the Nueces River. That was, um, that was Nuevo Santander. And it has the names in that map. You should try to look, at, look it up in the library. It has all the indigenous people that lived in those areas. And it has their names and it has the symbols. And it has the little casitas where they used to live and settlements, so it's a very beautiful map. So I started finding those things that were really very interesting to me because of course we're mestizos, we're hybrids, and so we're all part of that culture. Uh, so, I, so in order to do that, I had to decolonize myself because we were colonized by the dominant culture. To decolonize myself, like I said, I had to look not only at our immediate culture, but also ancient culture of Mexico and also contemporary Mexico and modern Mexico. So I started doing that and I did some drawings based on um, like I, myself and at that time I had my, my daughter was little and I wanted to for her also to learn about that history. And so I, this is sort of like the grandmother talking to the child and telling her about her history and the cuentos in the story and the, and the family. And so, and that's my daughter in the middle. Uh, it was a pencil drawing. And then I also 
when I did my graduate work and I was told you can't do, you can't do murals, you know, you have to do something that's individual. So I thought, okay, well, what do I do? And so um, at that time, um, I was already doing research on uh, the culture. And one of the dominant things in the culture is curanderismo. And I'm from Kingsville, and I always heard the stories of Don Pedro Jaramillo. So uh, a lot of beautiful stories. And so I thought, well, let me look into curanderismo. And it turns out that curanderismo is based on ancient history of Siberia. It's called uh, shamanism. So my thesis ended up being on shamanism. And one of the strong components of shamanism, according to the huicholes, they actually dream the future. And in the dreams, they interpret that, how they're gonna live their life. And so I started dreaming all these things because I was doing so much research. And a lot of the dreams would deal with the family and very interesting things. And one of the stories, and I didn't include it here, but one of the things that I did, I, I, my sister started to get sick. Uh, let me go forward. My younger sister was a, was a student, also UT Austin. She started to get mentally ill. And I would have these dreams about her, about how we were trying to heal her in these dreams. And in one of the dreams, and I don't have the image here, and I'm sorry I didn't include any of the dream images, but in one of those dreams, she was little and she was sitting on the floor and we were in the room, in like a living room, and we had someone a curandero and he had like a tank of water. And there was a, he had in his hands an effigy that was black ceramics. And on the side of it was, um, this is all the dream. On the side of it was an eye. And, and he was supposed to take that effigy and go into the primordial, primordial waters of creation. And because he believed that my sister was sick because she had soul loss. So he was gonna go into the primordial waters of creation, retrieve her lost soul, put it in the duck, it was a little duck, and bring it back into the physical plane. Years later, when I moved back to Kingsville, I was in a show called Atzlan, a mythic homeland that was organized by the Contemporary Museum in Los Angeles, and it traveled to Austin. And I went to Austin to see the show, and it was from prehistoric times into the present time, the colonial, the, the modern, and then the contemporary. And I was in the modern period, the contemporary period. I took my students, because I was teaching at Texas A&M Kingsville, and as we go into the prehistoric period, they had all these ceramic things and one of them was my little black duck with the eye on it. And it said shamanism, and it had the approximate date, and it said history unknown. But I dreamed it. So that's called collective memory. So I started using all of that in my art. So, uh, so then I started looking at people of ancient Mexico and the goddesses. Like, for example, do we have, is this a pointer? I don't know, is this a pointer? Well. No. Let's see. So I can. Uh, you don't have to click it. Oh, there. How do you do it? There's, it says pointing. Oh, okay. I don't know if you can move it around. No, I just want that one. It's called Kualique. That's the earth goddess. So I started working on Kualique, the earth goddess. The one above it is a mural. I did a series of multicultural murals when I taught at Penn State. And all of my students came and we worked on like a series of 10 different murals. And one of them was that one. It was multicultural muralism or mural. And it was of uh, Emiliano Zapata in the ground. And it's like a codas, ancient books of Mexico underneath. And then you see on the, on the right hand side, uh, Cortez coming in as a, as a robot, as a metal soldier, destroying everything in his sight. And then next to him is the rain god, fertilizing the earth with amulets in his hands. And um, so we did this with, um, with students at Penn State. So I wanted you to see that. I also did the Malinche, which is that, um, well, uh, it just, it doesn't point. The Malinche is the one with the red background and the Rodetete, I think it's called, around her head. And that's Cortez behind her. So I don't know if you know the story of Malinche. And there's a show that's opening here at the San Antonio Art Museum next month. And I'm in that show and that piece is in the show. And it's, um, you should go, it's gonna be there until January. It was organized in Denver Art Museum. It went to the Albuquerque Art Museum and it's gonna open on the 15th here in, in San Antonio, of October in San Antonio, and it'll be there till January. And they're using it on, um, like when you buy the ticket to go in, it's gonna be on this ticket. They're using posters, they're using banners of this particular image. So it's kind of an important piece, but what I did is, um, you see Hernan Cortez behind her, He's looking at her like a voyager, you know, like admiring her. But the point is, um, 
I don't know if you know the story, but when Narcotes entered Veracruz in 1519, he fought the city that, um, that he entered. And of course, when he entered, he came in his ship and he came with horses. Horses were not native to Mexico or the Americas, the continent of the Americas. So he came his horses. They were wearing metal armors and they had swords and they had all kinds of um, gear, metal gear. And they come riding on the horses and go, go to the village and they had dogs. And so um, <clears throat> the villagers, the indigenous people had never seen a, a, an Hispanic um, white person. They've never seen horses. Um, and so they were mesmerized by it, and they thought that the rider on the horse and the horse was one entity, and they call it the double-headed entity. So Orozco, the artist from Mexico, at the turn of the 20th century, started painting horses with two heads. So my horses have two heads up there. You see it in the background. And of course, when they came in, they destroyed the culture, and they destroyed the religion that they had. So you can see the missionary priest with a cross and the people hanging from the trees. So that's kind of like the blood of the land of Mexico. So that's what that's about. But then, I don't know if you're aware of the story is that when he conquered that village, the tradition in Mexico was, in ancient Mexico, was that you give gifts to the victor. And so the mayor of the city gave her 20 young maidens. And one of them was this woman. She was a teenager by the name of uh, Malinche. They called her Malinche, but later on her name was Doña Mariana. Um, but she had been sold into slavery by her own parents. She was from the aristocrat, and she was from the Nahua tongue. You know, there were a lot of indigenous tongues. So she knew the Nahua tongue, and she had been sold to the Mayans. So she knew several dialects of the Mayans. The Spanish could not communicate with the, the indigenous because they didn't know the language. But she knew how to speak several indigenous languages. And then there was a uh, Jeronimo Aguilar, who was one of the Hispanic soldiers who had come to the Americas before Hernán Cortés arrived, and he married a woman in the Mayan culture. So he knew the language, one of the Mayan dialects. So what they did is she would translate to, um, when they found out that she could do this, she became like this personal secretary of Cortés. And eventually, they actually became romantically involved, and they had a child by the name of Martín, who was raised as a Spaniard. Uh, but anyway. Um, so that's Martin, or the, the birth of the hybrid. So she is the mother of mestizaje, or the mother of hybridization, or the mother of the biological blend. So that's what that's all about. And I use the Maguey plan as a symbol of resurrection and rebirth in my work. And the Maguey plan has, um, uh, if you ferment it, if you put a bottle in the center, um, in the campos in, in Mexico, this white milk goes into it and a little worm. And if you ferment it, it becomes tequila. But if you don't ferment it, it's high in protein and they feed it to the babies because you know they're, they're very poor. And so, um, so it has uh, nourishment. Also, um, and I'm gonna talk about it, when the Virgen de Guadalupe appeared, she appeared on a tilma. The tilma is made from the fiber of the maguey. They would make clothing out of it. They would make food out of it. So it's like this self-sustaining plant. And so I use it as a symbol of resurrection and rebirth in my work. Um, um, so these are some of the things of ancient Mexico that I, that I did. Like, for example, the, the image in the center is actually a ceramic uh, full-size figure that they found in um, Mexico City underneath the cathedral where they were be, uh, excavating and they found Coyochalqui, the moon goddess, in a disc. And they found other things and they found pyramids buried underneath the ground. And one of the things that they found is these young men, ceramic young boys, they were wearing a baby on their back. It was symbol, they were sun worshipers. So they worship uh, the sun god. And so at night, they believe that, that, that he would become a child and be reborn in the morning. So the priests of Quetzalcoatl, they were Quetzalcoatl worshipers, they would actually carry him on their back symbolically, and then in the morning he would be reborn. And then the women, the Cihuateteos, the female warriors, will carry it until it's set again. So what I did is I did a female with a child in the back, and that's an oil painting. And then the other one is Guadalupe and Malinche together. And then this uh, one is on a mate paper. The, this is four feet by eight feet. And this is um, Codas of the Don Santes. I received a... Um, a grant from Lila Wallace in Reader's Digest in 
the early 1990s and I went to Oaxaca and I had a studio there and I worked in Mexico. And so I became very enthused with um, what they were doing with the Amate paper. And interestingly enough, you don't, the Amate paper was a sacred paper to Montezuma. They would actually, you know, they, the Aztecs had control of all the tribes. And so what they would do is you would have to pay tribute to the, war, to the leaders, which were the Aztecs. And they would make this paper in San Andres. And they would pay tons and tons of tribute in this paper to Montezuma because it was a sacred paper. They would make their sacred books out of it. They would actually make effigies and deities and cut them out and they would burn them and offer them to the gods. And interestingly, I discovered that the paper is made from a fig tree, the bark of a fig tree. And the fig tree, I don't know if you know this, in the Bible, it was a tree of life. So it was sacred. And how did the Aztecs know that? You know, it's very interesting, all of that. So anyway, and then the other image is Popo Enitsa, the legend of Popo Enitsa, but I sort of reversed it where the female is carrying the man. But Popo Enitsa, <laughs> right? <laughs> Popo Enitsa. <laughs> The legend is that, uh, that there were lovers like uh, Romeo and Juliet, and they, uh, he went off to war, and he never came back, and so she later found out that he had died in the battle, and she got very distraught uh, that she went up to the mountain and she laid down, and, uh, and she died from heart, heart problems, or heart broke, she was, her heart was broken. He came back, he was alive, and he found her, and he carried her in his arm, and they said that he became a stone. So if you go to the mountains, which is, uh, Outside of um, Puebla, you'll see the Malinche Mountains, and you'll see them like a man carrying this woman. So that's what it's called, Popo Enitsa. So I did, it's a legend, so I went ahead and did some prints on that. So I became very excited about all these things when I was doing the work. And then, of course, I, I sort of not only dealt with Mesoamerica, but I also dealt with um, the turn of the century in Mexico, you know, in 1810. Uh, Mexico ga gained its independence from Spain, so there was a lot of Hidalgo images that some of the other artists did. I also did um, the Mexican Revolution because I felt an affiliation with it because my relatives were involved with the Mexican Revolution. Uh, we did what is called reverse migration. Uh, reverse migration is where the people that were in Texas went back to Mexico. And so my relatives went back to Mexico at the turn of the century when World War I was going on. So they did reverse migration and they lived in Tamalipas. And so that's where my grandfather met my grandmother and then they married and they came back to the United States. But my family's actually from the Kennedy Ranch. We're actually um, the vaqueros that ran the Kennedy Ranch. Ken R Mifflin Kennedy and Richard King were the cattle barons of South Texas. And so my great grandfather, Teofilo Barraza, if you look at that Leon book on the history of Texas, he's in there because he surveyed the estate between Mifflin Kennedy and Richard King. And so that's where we're from. Um, so, but my grandmother's, on my father's side, when my grandfather married my grandmother, um, Mesa was her last name, she had a brother and he decided to join the Mexican Revolution and he went and fought with Pancho Villa and he died in Mexico. So, so anyway, so I felt an affiliation, so I started doing uh, artwork dealing with the agrarian movement of uh, the revolution, the Mexican Revolution. I was very interested in the role of women, the Adelitas. And I want to tell you a story of the Adelitas because I started, I started doing that like in the, when I was in graduate school and thereafter. And at one time, I went to Mexico and I had some friends that lived in um, San Miguel de Allende. And they knew that I love the maguey plants. And they said, why don't we go out to the fields over there and you can see the maguey plants. And I wanted to take photographs of the plants. And the girl that invited me, she was a dancer. And she says, I'm really tired. I'm going to sit here. You go and take your photographs and you come back. So I went and took my photographs. And I was taking the photographs. I heard children uh, playing. And I heard voices and running like they're playing. And, but I never saw anybody. So I came back. And she was waiting for me and I said, you know, I heard all these children playing. And she said, oh yeah, I didn't want to tell you. She says, but here there was a big battle during the Mexican Revolution and the children that were, were murdered here. And so those were the voices that you're hearing. Yeah, so it was, it was incredible. So, so I became very interested in the, so all these stories, you know, I use in my art. Um, in, uh, I think it was the 1970s, uh, Mark Zufer from Washington DC organized an exhibition at the Smithsonian on the role, uh, the artwork that was being produced by Chicanos. Um, 
dealing with the Mexican Revolution and the photographs of Victor Agustin Casasola. And I used a lot of his photographs in my art. I used like the ones over there, the, the Adelitas and the little boy, and then I changed it and added other things to it. But those, those were all using the photographs of Casasola and then changing them a little bit. Oh, and that was the catalog to the Smithsonian show. Um, so I became very interested in the Adelitas, the stories in my family about that. Uh, these are my grandparents. Now they were not, these are my grandparents, Espitacion Contreras and his wife Andrea, and then these are Adelitas. So I started using that a lot in my work um, because I was very interested in the role of women um, in history. And then I understand when I went to Oaxaca too, there were goddesses in Oaxaca, there were female warriors. And I'll talk about that a little bit. So then I started becoming very interested in reclaiming that history in my art and doing research about it. And so I started reclaiming a lot of the goddesses like Coyochalqui. Coyochalqui was the moon goddess in ancient Mexico. So she was dismembered by her brother in a battle. Her brother was the, the son of the sun. And so her body fell to the earth and that's where they found her in Templo Mayor, it's called in Mexico City. They found her disc of her, her dismembered body. And so uh, if you go to Mexico City, you can go to the museum, Templo Mayor, and see the big disc. I think it's like 20 feet in diameter. Uh, <clears throat> and then I did this other one, La Mano Poderosa de Coyo Chalqui. I envision in my mind, because I know Gloria, I know Gloria and Saldúa and did a project with her. I'm gonna talk about it in a few minutes. But Gloria and Saldúa had this wonderful theory that this millennium was the millennium of the women and that we were gonna take back everything that had been taken away from us. And so that because America was a, a, ma a maternal um, continent until the men took over and everything became fee uh, male oriented. And so she felt that this was the millennium of the women and we're, we were gonna take back their power. So she believed that Coyo Chalqui was that symbol because she was a female warrior. Um, so I started also not using um, Coyo Chalqui, but also the Virgen de Guadalupe. And some of the stories is that, you know, we had a lot of stories in the family, but um, I really, really enjoyed a lot of the things about her, uh, particularly the symbols. They've now discovered that her dress is a codas. The codas were the ancient books of Mexico. And that that's why when she appeared in 1531, uh, December the 12th, 1531, which was 12 years after the conquest, and it was a few years after Malinche had died, that, um, that there was massive conversion to Christianity more than in any time in the history of the world. And they say that they think that happened because they could read her dress. Her dress has symbols in it. And the dress actually talked, there's a symbol, I don't know if you can see it. Well, I changed some of the symbols, but there's a symbol in here that represents what is called Kayi. Kayi is the temple or the house. And, they, and she, and it also represented her heart. So she was telling, come back to my house. Because where she appeared, it was the site, it was in Lake Tepeyac, it was the same site where Tonatzin, their goddess had appeared years before in ancient Mexico. And she was her mother's symbol. And she had appeared there. And so they could read it and they thought it was little Tonatzin coming back to life. And so there was massive conversions. There were a lot of things also. They've, uh, they say that if you put the tilma on the floor, um, that the stars were aligned to the cosmos on the day and the time and the year and the century that she appeared. Mm -hmm. So they've done computerized um, analysis and they found out that that's, that's what it is. And so I was very much enthused with, by that. And so I use her as a symbol of uh, empowerment, not as a submissive symbol, but as a symbol of empowerment for women. And below that in the, in the middle is the corn goddess. And you can see her and behind her is a cloud that's uh, raining the earth and the earth is uh, um, coming back to life. And the one over here is Mayawel. This is the goddess of the patron saint of rebirth. So there's a very interesting story about her and I actually heard it firsthand from the people in Oaxaca. And they told me, well, you know, Mayawel was a little girl. They have these stories, beautiful stories, that Mayawel was a beautiful little princess and that she was, she was a young woman and one of the gods fell in love with her and wanted to possess her, but she denied him. And so he got really angry and he came down from the heavens and he dismembered her and he cut her head and he threw her head in a field and from the head grew the maguey plant. And so the maguey plant became the symbol of rebirth. So that women, when they died in childbirth, the Siwateteos, 
when they died in childbirth, their soul became a soul of, um, of the warriors. They went, because they believed there were 13 levels in the heavens. And the, the male warriors, when they died in battle, their soul will go to the, I think it was the 10th or the 11th uh, level. And the females, when they died in childbirth, they also would go to that same level. And so they were the ones that would carry the baby on their back when it was being reborn. And then the men would take it in, in the, at night. So it's a really interesting story. So I, I became very mesmerized by all of that, and I started using it in my work. Of course, these are other images. Of, uh, in the middle is uh, La Llorona. It's actually a retablo made on metal. And it, she has two heads because she was uh, good and evil. Uh, but La Llorona, I, re I found out that it was Cihuateteo. La Llorona was uh, the ancient story of Cihuateteo, the woman that died in childbirth. And so there was one time during the calendar year that she was allowed to come back to the physical plane. And at that time, the transformative element was water. And so she would, you would find her wailing in the bodies of water. And so that was the story of La Llorona. You see behind her, the child, um, be above the two heads, that's the child, the deceased child. And then you see the moon goddess and the half moon, the way they have it in the ancient books of, Co of Mexico, the codices. This is also another example. This is called the Trinity. I call it the Trinity. But this is an interpretation of the Virgen de Guadalupe with my mother and my grandmother. This is the only photograph. I did it off of a photograph that we have of my grandmother when she was dating my grandfather. And so she was my uh, mother's mother. So I, I really admired the qualities. They were very strong women. So I put them in this painting. Um, this is another, the one on the far left. These are all on, a, these were all on amate paper. So amate paper is that sacred paper of the fig tree that I was telling you about. And then in the center is Selena. There was a codice, which is a very interesting codice um, that, uh, from ancient Mexico, they told about the role of women, how women were supposed to behave, how women were supposed to do things. And so it had little houses and out of that, and um, in the codas you have women coming out of the, the roof of the houses and they're doing things with their hands and they're wearing the traditional attire of ancient Mexico. So I took that idea and I put my heroes in them. So I put Selena in there and then I did one with Frida Kahlo and Coyochalqui, the moon goddess behind her. Then the one over there is the Virgen de Guadalupe. This one are small. These are, I think you can see the original one in the, the display booth that we have. I have this one over there. That one is very large. The Guadalupe is four feet by eight feet. It's on a mate paper. And um, I have that in my gallery, so you're welcome to come to my gallery in Kingsville and see the work. I also did sand paintings of ancient Mexico. So you can see the sand paintings below. I did this with some of my students. I recruited some students from Oaxaca, and we did some of these. Uh, this is at the museum, the Ney Museum in Victoria. And this was for Day of the Dead. So we did the Dos Fridas. I don't know if you remember that painting of the two Fridas. And then this is the sand painting of the earth. There was a four-leaf clover with a center part in it. And they found that in uh, Teotihuacan and that represented the, the earth, the Mother Earth. Is that it? I don't think it goes any further. Can someone tell me that's the last one? I don't think it's the last one. It's stuck. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, because it says it goes to 25. Yeah, because you have oh, this. Oh. You're good. Is that it? Then OK. Did you use this? The, yeah, that's what I was using. Point. And then you can also use this to point at them. Oh, okay, with great. Your finger. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So then um, I'm going to show you some artwork of the borderlands. And um, <laughs> these are um, Emma Tenayuca. You probably know who she is. She's from San Antonio. So you can see her over there with the moon goddess. Um, um, I see her as a female warrior. And then you can see her over here too, the codice of Emma Tenayuca. And you can see the women, they, when they went on strike in the pecan shell uh, business. And you can see them in the background behind her uh, doing the, peeling the pecans. And then below that on the far left, that, this is uh, 
Rigoberta Menchu. No, I can't do it. <laughs> and, um, and I got to meet Rigoberta Menchu in Chicago. I did a similar painting like that, and uh, I knew some of the people that had invited her. She came to the University of Illinois in Chicago, and I was teaching at the Art Institute at that time. So they invited me to visit her uh, backstage before she went on to do her lecture. And she's very tiny. She's like four feet tall. And, um, and I gave her uh, a piece that I had done on a mate paper. I gave it to her, and she valued it very much. She said she was going to put it in her office. And um, it was very interesting because the students uh, had invited her. And she told the students, and of course, she spoke Spanish and she spoke Quechua, uh, but she didn't speak any English, so they had a translator. And I remember at one point, um, she spoke in Spanish, and the translator said something. And she looked at her, and she said, that's not what I said. So she knew English, too. You know? <laughs> so, it was very, yeah, so it was very interesting. Um, but she was a wonderful person, and she told the audience that, the re, that she gets invited all over the world. Of course, this was in the, 19, the early 1990s when I was there. She says, I get invited all over the world. I can go anywhere because I get all these invitations, but I came here because you're the future. So it was, it was very interesting. So she was a really wonderful person. And this one, again, is La Llorona. And you can see, this is Petra Vela. She was the wife of Mifflin Kennedy, the Kennedy Ranch. And then this is Guadalupe and Adelita and the Llorona de Cihuateteo. She has here on her arms, these are the symbols from the Mayan culture, darkness and lightness. And then she has a hand over her, her mouth that is a symbol of transformation to infinity. Um, so these are some of the work that I also did that I re, re, um, that were related to the agrarian movement, you know, of Cesar Chavez, the pencil drawing called Los Migrantes over there with the child and the little, the man. This was actually taken, from, uh, done from a photograph by Russell Lee. Russell Lee was a phot uh, photographer, professor at UT Austin when I was there, but he was hired by um, the Roosevelt administration to be part of, to document Americana. Uh, they went all over, they hired muralists, they hired artists, writers. They went all over the United States and documented the culture of the United States. He went to California and he went to the migrant camps that they had under the Bracero program. And he documented the families in the tents, living in the tents. And this is a photograph from that. So that was Russell Lee. He was a very wonderful person. Um, uh, of course, they're all gone now, but um, he, in, in his paintings, in his photographs, if you ever look at, he has books out on his work and you should look at it. He always has like a symbol of a pyramid in the center, light in the pyramid. And I think a lot of it had to do, in my estimation, is because he was uh, actually an orphan. He was adopted, so he never knew his real family. So he was always trying, he was always looking for a family, always. So you can see it in his photographs. And this is a pencil drawing that I did of a black mother and her child. This was done in 1975. Um, and then this is Nepantla. This was a pro uh, painting I did when I worked with Gloria Saldúa in that project of Nepantla, and I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes. And the other one actually belongs to the Texas Tech, the Museum of Texas Tech University. Uh, it's a huge painting. It's of my mother as she was a young woman, and then the Virgen de Guadalupe behind her with her parents, and then La Catrina. Well, I think I'm stuck again. Ooh. Is that correct? Okay. Let's see. Okay. Well, okay, that's it, right? Okay, and there's some mate paper. The, that's my mother again coming out of the house with the tree of life from the Mayan culture behind her. And then Don Pedro Jaramillo, and that's a retablo in metal. And then myself is uh, Canuta. Canuta was my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mother. And she was victimized by Richard King uh, because they had land in South Texas. And so they were persecuting people and trying to buy the land for like a bag of gold. And they would go to your ranch and offer you the money to, to buy your land. And of course, you've been there for generations. You didn't want to sell it. And they would force you at gunpoint. They had their pistoleros. And they would say, well, you're going you're gonna to sign and you're going to sell the land. And so they would do that and they would give them the bag of gold and they said, you have to leave tonight. So when they would leave at night, they would ambush them, take the same bag of gold and go to another rancho. So that was, the, that was some of the folklore uh, stories. And then my, my relatives were part of that 
that victimization. So this is, I have a photograph of um, Canuta Vela, who's my grandfather's mother, and she's standing, and she was a very proud woman. Um, her, fa her husband was murdered by Richard King or the Pistoleros, and so I have her, I sort of put myself in her dress, wearing with a skull in my hand and the dead people in the background. And this is um, some of the first books that were actually printed on Chicano art, the Chicano Voices by Carlota Dreyer. They use some of my work in it. Also, Ines Hernandez published this book recently. Then Schiffer Goldman, The Tradition and Transformation, Chicano Art, and then my book. Um, and so there was a lot of books at that time. This one, this is the only copy I have and it's really destroyed, but you can see Embra. This was done by Ines at UT Austin in the, I think it was the Ethnic Studies program. And that's some of my work that was in the book. And the cover was actually designed by Carmen Lomas Garza. And I believe it was 1976. And then we did, um, I was part of Los Quemados, our group that actually organized itself here in San Antonio and Austin. And there were very few women in the organization. Amado Peña was a member, Jose Trevino, um, Chente Rodriguez, um, Cesar Martinez, myself, Carolina Flores, and Carmen Lomas Garza. And we decided um, the women wanted more women in there. And for some reason, it didn't happen. So then we decided, well, we're going to go ahead and just form our own group. So we formed MAS, Mujeres Artistas del Suroeste, in 1975, and we were active for a decade. And Nora Gonzalez Dotson uh, co-founded it with myself. And so these are some of the projects that we did. And this was an article. These are some of the members. Um, of the group, and that essay was written by Dr. Shifra Goldman, who's not with us anymore, but she um, wrote an essay on MAS, and it was published in Los Angeles. We did a very important project that I thought was very important. It was the first encounter between the Chicanos and the Mexicano artists, and so we invited artists from Mexico City to come to Austin. We held it in Austin in 1979 called Conferencia Plastica Chicana, and that was the first time that we knew who the artists, the real artists were in Mexico and the scholars, and, and artists, Chicano artists came from all over the United States to that conference, and we had it like for three days. And we also brought students from San Carlos Academy of Art. We brought about 10, 20 students that came to the conference. So it was a very important conference, and then after that, we started to have more conferences and exhibitions in Mexico. Until that point, we didn't have any, but we, st we did A Través de la Frontera, I think in 1981, that was sponsored by Presidente Echeverria. And then we did um, another one called Carteles Chicanos, which was in Mexico City too. And then I was in a show called Art of the Other Mexico that started in Chicago and it went to the Museum of Modern Art in Mexico City. So since then, there's been a lot of exhibitions, um, but that was uh, some of the projects that we did. Uh, these are, in 1995, I was invited with her by Gloria Saldúa to participate in this project called Nepantla. And it was, uh, an Epanla is an indigenous word for a collision between two opposing cultures, and then a third one emerges. And Gloria felt that it was a hybridization. It could be related to gender. It could be related to a lot of things. And so the people that were selected is Liliana Wilson from Austin, Texas, myself. And at that time, I was living in Chicago. And then uh, Tina Guerra, she's from Mexico City. And then uh, Isabel Juarez, she was from Chiapas. She was a writer and then Gloria and Saldua. We lived together in Saratoga, California for six weeks and we worked on this whole concept. The writers wrote and then we produced art. And these are some of the pieces that I produced for that in that project. We were together for six weeks and I remember Gloria told me, okay, you're gonna, you organize the women's and I put you in charge of the women artists. And so we had a meeting and I told them, okay, we have six weeks, so we gotta produce 20 pieces. And they said, what? I said, yeah, 20 pieces. And they said, well, so they hated me. So Liliana, Liliana and Tina would not speak to me the whole time. They never spoke to me. But afterwards, they were so excited because Liliana was able to produce 20 pieces. And she said, I've never been forced to do it, but I did it. So, um, so they were very happy that I <laughs> forced them to do that. So these are some of the pieces that I did in that exhibition. And you can see they're very large. And this one over here is an oil painting, and that one is charcoal drawing on canvas. And I also did a project while I was there, it was part of mine. 
I went into San Jose and I worked with homeless families and we did a tableau paintings and it was part of the exhibition too. We had a show of the writings and the artwork in uh, San Jose, California in a cultural center and they included the students. And I remember when I went to the cultural center of the homeless families, I told them that I needed to work with the children for about a week and they said, well, I don't think we can let you do that because the children, uh, they're here just temporary. They leave in two days, three days. Nobody stays here for more than a week. And, and they told me, how long do you need to do the project? And I said, I need at least a week. They said, well, they're not gonna produce the work and I don't think, but you can do it if you want to, but we just wanna let you know. So I said, okay, I'll work with that. So I worked with them and they were so excited and they actually did the work and the parents got really excited too and they produced some art too. So they were like dumbfounded that the kids were able to do that. So it was part of the exhibition too. So I was very interested in including the community. These are some of the pieces of the public art. This is actually a UTSA, like I was telling you at the Biosciences Building. This is a retablo mural and it's on a curved wall. It weighs like two tons. We had to like use, we had to tear the wall because they were building the building. So we worked with Henry Munoz and Kel, the architects, and they designed the building and we did the public art. And that's my mural over there. And then there's the water fountain underneath and I did those at UTSA. And then I did the mural of Madre Julia Navarrete in Kingsville. She is uh, being canonized as a saint. Um, there's very, I, when they told me to do that mural, I said, well, it's gonna be very difficult because I don't know who she is. And they said, okay, well, here are the books, you read them. So I read the books on, uh, it was incredible, incredible, incredible book. She was originally from Oaxaca. She left Oaxaca and came to Kingsville and set up a school for the Mexican kids and they had, um, and also the order, she actually uh, founded that order of the nuns. I think it's called the Congregation of the Most Purest Virgin Mary or something like that. And um, when I started reading the book, it was an incredible book because it, it uh, in Oaxaca at that time, we're talking about the turn of the century, like the, the late 18, 19, what was it, 1890s, she, um, they had like personal advisors in the religion. So the families, I think that the well-to-do had these personal advisors and they would advise the family as to what the children should do in religion. And what her priest told her is that she wasn't uh, that focused and that she needed to be more focused on religion. So he recommended that they build a cross and that she get up on the cross and that she would do that for a certain number of days. So she started doing that and she would stay in the cross position for like, I think like 30, 40 minutes or an hour. And then after that, she would come down from the cross and she would pass out and she would have these visions. And so at that point, she decided that she wanted to be a nun. But can you imagine that? I mean, that's what she did. And towards the end of her life, and um, when she died, one of the nuns um, who actually hired me to do the, the mural was her personal assistant until she died. And um, she was uh, telling me that, that she had cancer towards the end of her life and she had like sores all over her back, but she wanted to suffer. So she would pray to God to give her more pain, to give her more pain. I mean, can you imagine? It was, she was very strong. So anyway, so I did that mural of uh, Madre Julia Navarrete. It's on Richard Street where the Mexican kids, see we were not allowed to go and shop where the white people went. So that was in downtown Claiborne. Those where the shopping stores were. We had to build our own communities, which was on Richard Street, and that's where we shopped, and that's where they had the school. And it has been restored, so this is part of the restoration. And now they have the, the chapel where, they, where the nuns lived, or where they prayed, and they have also a school, it used to be, but now it's like a museum. So if you go there, you should go see it. It's on Richard Street. Yeah, in, in Kingsville. Kingsville, Texas. And so these are some of the other murals that I did. I did this in um, um, St. Anthony's Church. It was on wood and um, it was like three stories high. And what they asked me to do is they said, well, we have, um, we have uh, an image of the Virgen that this man donated to us, but it needs to be repaired. It was very old, it was falling apart. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I did it with some of my students and a local artist by the name of Daniel, Daniel Cuellar. He's a very talented artist from Kingsville. And um, so we re-prepared the, the wood and we actually painted it. And then uh, I found out years later 
And I told them, you need to varnish it because it's in bad repair and it's repaired. So you need to seal it, so you need to varnish it. Well, they never varnished it, so it got better, worse and worse, and it deteriorated, and finally it was no good. And so they threw it away without telling me. They took it down, and they hired somebody else to do it. We did it free, you know, and they got somebody else to do it, and they did another one, and I have no idea what happened to this. I guess they threw it away, and I was kind of distraught. This one was a really interesting project. Every year I do something to commemorate the Virgen de Guadalupe, and that year we decided to go to Richard Street, and we closed off the street. We got permission from the city to close off the street where the Mexican stores used to be. They're no longer there. They're all abandoned. They're falling apart. So we took the street, and we did a chalk drawing at the Virgen de Guadalupe, full size. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I got my students to work on it. And what was really in, we did it in one day. And so I remember that um, the, the people started coming. And we blocked off the street. But then um, it started to rain. And so after the, they, they took the blocks off after two days, and people would come on the street, and they would see the image, and they would turn around. They wouldn't drive over it. They were afraid to drive over it. And then they thought people started coming from Corpus Christi and surrounding towns because they thought the image had appeared there. And they started bringing roses, and they started bringing things. Yeah, so it was very exciting. Um, and then the other one, as you can see, this is I did it on a cement slab in Kingsville. You can see that's Daniel Cuellar. You see him, he looks like an ant. That's how big it is. You see him? So this photograph, I think, was taken from an airplane because they couldn't photograph it. And this is the face of this image of the Virgen. So. Well, I think I'm stuck again, right? Low battery is running low. Okay. It won't, it won't go further. Oh, in my computer? Yeah. <laughs> or maybe you can advance it. Can I still work on it? I always have my stories. Is that the last one? Uh-huh. Okay. I think we can, we can survive. Okay, and this is some of the other paintings that I did. This is a mural also. This is like nine feet by 12 feet. It's on canvas. And again, it's called El Poder de las Mujeres. And then this is actually a retablo mural. My sister had, my sister since then has died. But when she was a young woman, uh, she actually uh, uh, joined an order called the, Chari the Pink Nuns. Daughters of Charity, and she became a cloister nun. So they would pray all day. And I actually, did, I had dreams of that, late, and I didn't realize it was that. But I remember going to visit her. At, they had a, an order in Austin. They had one in Corpus Christi. They had one in Chicago, and I think one in Philadelphia. And I remember going to visit her with my mother. <clears throat> and I don't know if you know about the cloister convents. There's a convent, and it had bars. You would go to a reception area, and on this side where you would go in, there was like beautiful furniture. But then there were bars that divided the room in half. And on the other side, there was nothing. So she would come in, and you couldn't touch her. So if you wanted to give her something, there was a little thing, a little, that you would put it on this side and rotate it to her side. And I couldn't believe it, that, that that was a style. And then we went, afterwards, we would go to the church, the chapel, to pray. And the nuns, the chapel, the church was also with bars. So all the pews were over here, and there were bars on the altar, and the nuns were behind the altar, on their face in the crucifix form, praying. Yeah, it was incredible. But during that time that she was there, she wanted to be part of the, nun, uh, the order, and she was. She was a novice. But what happened is she had heart problems, and so she needed an open heart surgery. So she, they sent her back to Austin, because she was in Philadelphia at that time. They sent her back to Austin, and they, she had open heart surgery. And it was in the 1970s, so it was very rudimental, you know, very kind of barbaric the way they did it. So years later, she started having problems, and eventually she had a stroke and died. And she died in uh, 2016. But uh, so this is a retablo that I did when they, I did it years later, you know, commemorating the operation of her soul and then of her heart, and then it's in the dirt, uh, in the earth, buried. And then this is, um, I think Ines used this in her book, you know, and this is um, the maguey with a sacred heart above it. And I, 
You know, you probably think that that's a Christian symbol and it's not really. I got the idea from the codices of ancient Mexico. And in the codices, the Aztecs, there's a story of a narration where they, their God told them to leave. I think it was Wichipochtli uh, told them to leave and go look for the promised land. Very similar to, to the Jews, you know, from, uh, from Israel. And so they left, they lived in caves. And so in the caves, they left their caves and they went looking for their promised land, but they still sacrificed to their gods, but they had no temple and they had no home. So they would sacrifice and put the heart over a maguey plant and offer it to the gods. So that's where that comes from. I think that's it. So do we have any questions? Yes. Again, I want to thank Santa Barata on behalf of the Latinita Conference Executive Committee. We are eternally grateful for uh, having her <laughs> present here. I know that I was a big conduit in that, and I'm very eternally <laughs> very grateful. Very persistent. Yes, to <laughs> Santa for her extensive patience and cooperation with us. And again, let us give her a bit, another big hand, and you're welcome to ask questions. <laughs> Oh, yes. I have a question. I'm from Kingsville, but I know half of what you're talking about. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, but I left when I was 21. So that's a lot. Of well, I left Kingsville when I was 18 yeah. to come to college yeah. or 17. Yeah. I'm going to go home and look for this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible. You know, we all, we, and I said in my books, I published a book in 2001, and it got the Southwest Book Award. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar, those of you that are artists, I mean, writers. When you produce a manuscript to a company, a publisher, they ask you for, they send it out to readers and readers read it and they say, this is good for to pre-publish or no, it's no good. Or yes, we recommend it, but you have to add this or you have to add that or you have to take this or you have to edit this or that. And what the, all of the readers said with my book was that, because uh, they asked me to do an autobiography of my work. And so one of the essays is autobiography. And they said that the best part of the book was my autobiography, which was the, because I talk about Kingsville and the land and the people. Yeah. yeah. So I went back home. So in my book, I say I left Kingsville looking for my destiny, but all the time it was in my backyard. And it's very interesting. Another one I want to say is that I get calls from people all over the world. And one of them was a woman who's doing a book on Moss. She's doing her dissertation on Moss. She's from Edinburgh. She's studying us in London. Can you believe that? And I said, what happened? You know, we're, you should have stayed home when we were here, you know? So she went to New York City and got her master's. And now she's doing her PhD. She went to Columbia. Now she's doing her PhD in London. You believe that? And then we get call. Well, I get calls from Germany and France. I had a show in Paris and Germany and Aust Vienna. So it's it's been it's been really nice. Yes, I think she had a question no, first. My, my is also cool. You mentioned the Stanley Canyon Museum of Art. Is that show going to be just your work? Or no. That show was organized by Tere Romo and curators from Denver Art Museum. Tere Romo's from San Francisco, California. She actually is very much, she's been with us like from the 70s when you know, we started doing the Chicano art and Ines knows her very well. So um, I'm so glad you're here, I haven't seen you in years. So, but um, it was organized, uh, it was supposed to open in San Francisco, but because of the pandemic, they canceled it. I think it was supposed to open, I don't know if it was San Francisco or Los Angeles. And so they postponed it. So they had a venue and the next venue was Denver. So it opened in Denver last year. Well, actually it was this year in February, it opened in Denver. And then it, it uh, finished in May and in June it opened in Den um, Albuquerque Art Museum. And now it's gonna come to San Antonio. It's a historic museum. There's a beautiful book that they published with it. The book was published by Yale University Press. And so I only have the Malinche painting. It's a little bitty painting, but they're using it in the banners. When I went to the Albuquerque Art Museum. They have it in the bus stations. They had it in banners. They had it in, I mean, I, I, I get down to go to the museum and it's right in front of the museum. It's a little bitty painting and it was huge. And I was so honored, yeah. So it's coming to San Antonio. It opens on the, the 15th of October, yeah. 
San Antonio Art Museum. Mm -hmm. So please go, and it'll be there to January, and I'm giving a lecture on Malinche on October the 24th. You can go online, I don't remember the 24th, the 21st, it's online. And so you can go online, and so I'll be doing a lecture on Malinche, and I'll be talking about you know, how her name means the five fingers in your hand. It was a bad omen. So a lot of things about Malinche in my research that I did to, to do her work, to do the paintings. Yes, I uh, have a question. Uh, Sandra, will you talk about your museum in Kingsville? Well, it's not a museum. I know Marta. Marta and her husband were instrumental in helping me. Yeah, Juan Cotera, because they actually were going to design. It's so small. It's okay. It's very small. So the idea was, okay, we're going to expand it. We're going to make it bigger. But it's in the historic zone. So there's so many rules and regulations. And so I had all these rules and regulations and to the point that I said, I can't do it, you know. And then they said, then they approved a design that I come up with. And they said, well, where's your parking lot? You need a parking lot of 20 cars. You need a parking lot of 20 cars. And I said, what? And they said, you got to buy land to build your parking lot. So I bought land across the street. I bought an acre of land. It's like a city block for the parking lot. And then I had to, then this is the other man uh, that was going to do the remodeling said, well, you know, because I decided, well, I'm just going to remodel, you know. And then he says, well, don't remodel. Nobody wanted to work on it. None of the people, they said, tear down the building. And I said, I can't tear it down, it's historic. You gotta tear it down, start all over. So nobody would work with me. And finally I got this one man that said, okay, I'll work with you. And then he says, since you own this land, just build something over here. So I actually designed, we came up with a Mayan Lapna architecture. It was a beautiful building, but it was almost like a million dollars to do it. So I said, I can't do it. So we went back to the little house and we restored it. So that's, and I have a little parking lot in the back. So, yes. So I was just going to say that I enjoyed working with you when you started on that. What, what came of that was that I realized very quickly it was going to be almost impossible for a, a fair amount of thought to do. Yeah. The city. Oh, it was they terrible. Yeah, and I know we worked with one of your assistants, I think, yes. and he was very nice. And the thing is that there were so many rules and regulations. Like, even now, I'm trying, my sister just moved back from New York to Kingsville, and she lives in the historic zone. And she says, you know, Santa, just sell your house, because I live out in the country. Sell your house and buy something close to the gallery or build something close to the gallery so you can just walk to the gallery. So I said, great. So I bought two lots, right? To build something or to move something there because I, I have several, I have two houses where I live. So I've, and one of them is my mother's old house. So I said, I'll move my mother's old house and live here. Well, guess what? They said, you have to have a structural engineer. You have to have an architect. You have, and I said, I, I can't do it, you know? It's like, you can't win. And they don't give you any funds. They don't have any loans. You have to do it all in your pocket, which is crazy. But you were asking, so, so she told me, oh, how is your institute? It's going to be your institute. And I said, it's not an art institute. It's just a little building. Yeah.